Correct. Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the inaugural session of Expanding Frontiers 2.0, Evidence from South Asia, where we try to question if the mainstream ideas work for our region. If yes, then how? If no, then why? Uh, this space is also to seek new ideas and solutions to address the economic challenges in our region. And this webinar series is jointly organized by Suresh Govindapuram and Vikram Barban and myself. Uh, today we have with us Dr. Shashi Shivramakrishna, and the title of his talk is An Introduction to Modern Money, the Modern Money Theory, MMT in short. He is presently Senior Adjunct Professor of Economics at uh, Narsi Monji Institute of Management Studies, Bangalore, and Vice Chairman of the Foundation to Aid Industrial Recovery, New Delhi and Bangalore. Dr. Shivram Krishna completed his master's degree from the University of Mumbai and PhD from um, Cornell University in Economics. And his research interests encompass a wide range of subjects from environmental to economic to monetary history to contemporary macro uh, macroeconomics. Uh, he has published widely in peer reviewed academic journals, is an author of three books. So, taking um, interdisciplinary approach seriously, uh, Dr. Shashi is an avid documentary filmmaker and also pursues his passion of uh, retracing Francis Buchanan's history uh, from 1800s. Um, across Southern India. And before I hand the floor to our speaker, rules of the game are, our speaker gets 40 to 45 minutes to deliver his thoughts, which is followed by a 15, 20 minutes Q&A. Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the questions yourself. Um, if the background noise is not too loud or you do not suffer from poor connectivity or bad throat, uh, you can drop your questions in the chat box. Okay, over to you, Shashi. Thank you, Anisha. So, hello everyone and yeah, let's begin. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what I want to do today is introduce some of the very basic tenets of uh, modern money theory. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with it, but uh, I would like to go through it right from the fundamentals. And uh, I won't cover, I mean, most of it, just the, just that, you know, uh, I would say two essential tenets of modern money. Uh, it's not specifically with reference to India or other South Asian countries, but I do make references to them uh, in passing during the lecture. But uh, maybe you, you know, in the Q and A session, you can you know raise some of these points. Okay, so that's that's what I thought. So yeah, uh, you know, I think a lot of us are you know exposed to what we read about in newspapers about money. Uh, and this is this actually is quite overwhelming, especially to a lot of uh, you know young scholars and uh, a lot of my students also. If you ask them about money, you know their, their notions about money. This is what uh, they would very you know commonly uh, reiterate. Right? So this is I've just uh, taken a few uh, you know sentences from uh, general news. Uh, so you know. We are all used to the, the, the notion that the government has to earn money and then spend, right? So it has limited uh, monetary resources in that sense. And uh, like a household or a you know company, it basically has to economize on the use of this uh, this money. Uh, that's that's really the bottom line. So of course you have this question of affordability. Uh, just like you and me, we cannot you know we cannot. Uh, afford a lot of things. Uh, so this is translated uh, into the same for the government where, uh, for instance, the government cannot afford a minimum uh, income or a basic income scheme or an employment guarantee scheme and things like that, right? It cannot, it has to, uh, you know, uh, keep the fiscal deficit uh, limited to some extent. It cannot afford to go beyond a certain number, which is usually now considered to be 3% of GDP. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, the question of affordability comes in when it's, uh, you know, about fiscal deficits. 
the government also might need to sell some of its assets in order to you know earn money uh, in order to spend uh, so that's another common notion and and that really drives a lot of privatization maybe for other reasons for, about efficiency and so on but one one reason for privatization might be for the government to you know earn money in order to spend on other on other sectors uh, we are also exposed to this notion of taxpayers money which are, which might be useful in some discourses, but I think uh, uh, you know it's common that the taxpayer now feels that he or she is actually funding a lot of government expenses, and their money should not be wasted in you know schemes which might which might uh, you know not appeal to them. Uh, so this is not specifically with reference to India or any of the South Asian countries. We even find it uh, in the UK, for example, where you know I got this recent. Uh, not very old statement from Jeremy Hunt, where he says that the government must give the world confidence so that they'll be able to pay their debt. Right? So just like you and me or a company, they have to be able to repay their debt. And therefore, they must consolidate on their expenses and you know, uh, uh, yeah, save money in that sense. And one might wonder whether you know the same thing happens in the United States uh, because after all it's the dollar. So maybe the other countries you can argue it's the pound, it's the rupee, it's not like the dollar. But we find the same kind of discourse in the United States. So, for instance, you know, uh, I, this is a, a, a senator, I think, or a congressman who said this, and you can see that you know they they're so worried about national debt, about spending money, about you know, how it's going to overwhelm families and businesses. And the key here is, you know, to live within uh, the me their means, uh, the, the government that is. And for all that is said, if you really look at uh, US debt over the years, this is from the 1970s or 60s, uh, it's always increasing. Uh, it's, uh, debt never decreases, right? So overall debt uh, as percentage of GDP, it might change, but uh, yeah, if you look at the overall US debt, it never really decreases. And in fact, it's interesting because if you look at uh, the early 2000s, there is actually a slowdown in the increase of debt. And the gray, the gray lines here are the recessions and you know uh, depressions in the US, uh, not depressions in this period, but yeah, major recessions. So you can see early 2000s, there's a, there's a recession and debt has actually been you know, flat there. And you can see also in the beginning of 2008, that debt is actually flat and uh, followed by a severe recession of 2008. So uh, maybe that's one reason uh, if you really you know, follow MMT, maybe that's a question which arises that if you try to repay debt, the state tries to repay its debt, it might cause uh, problems for the economy. But yeah, overall, you can see the trend here is it's never really decreased. In fact, it's very difficult to decrease debt. So I'll come to that later. So, you know, this is the normal view that we get in most textbooks like Matthews and, you know, so on, that uh, what we call the classical view of money, which is that money basically arose as, uh, you know, a means of exchange because barter was an inefficient system. And therefore, somewhere somebody in the private sector, in a, in some sense, invented money, and and this is important because once you have money, then exchanges become smoother. Uh, you can specialize. There'll be improvements in standards of living and so on. Right. So that's the you know basis for money. Uh, and the whole classical theory then is to you know ignore money in some sense and look at the real economy. Uh, you lift the veil, uh, you know, and look at the exchange mechanism of the real, real economy. And this, uh, you know, uh, you know, is present in most of the, you know, new classical thinking, the monist, monetarist thinking, the new Keynesian, even RBC theories, and so on. So all these kinds of theories have actually accepted the classical view more or less, uh, where you know. Uh, they accept the neutrality of money. Money can be ignored in some sense, and you look for real exchanges. Uh, so the way we define money today in most textbooks is that you know through its functions, right? So we all know this: the unit of account, the medium of exchange, and the store of value. So that's really the functions of money, which also defines money. Uh, but what's interesting is that money 
uh, in most of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, texts, for example, would be defined as an asset. Uh, and like gold, silver, even paper money or, you know, paper currency or uh, today cryptocurrencies. Uh, so any kind of asset uh, would be money. In fact, if you look at monetary aggregates, they look at assets and extend that to property and, you know, gold, silver, whatever it might be. Uh, so all that is money, really, and uh, we cannot ultimately use them for these uh, three functions, right, uh, in, in some sense. So, uh, but what's interesting is when you talk about an asset, it's not very clear what kind of asset it is, right? Because there are two types of asset. One is a physical asset, the other is a financial asset. And there's a big difference between them. So I wouldn't say this definition is, uh, this view is wrong, but yeah, it's limited in that sense, and it's a little confusing. Uh, if you think of it just as an asset without specifying what kind of asset it is. So Bitcoin, for example, would be very different from you know, paper currency, right? So the different kinds of assets. So we, we need to be careful here. And you know, that's one reason why we must delve into MM for a clearer definition of money. So I'm not going to go into the history of money, uh, but uh, I'm going to start with modern money, the definition of what we called modern money okay so so the whole idea of modern money theory and modern money is that it does not begin with uh, you know the problems associated with barter of course there are problems with barter and money is used to overcome those problems but it doesn't begin there uh, the story of money actually begins with the need uh, of the state you know to provision itself with real resources especially labor right so it wants to in some sense get labor to uh, you know, work for it in order to, for whatever purposes that it has, social good, you know, maybe armies, whatever it might be, right? So they need to draw these resources from the private sector, essentially labor. Of course, other resources too, but yeah, labor. In so how does it do this in a modern economy? It does this by issuing promissory notes, right? So uh, it's better to think of uh, money as a financial liability, because if you look at, you know, I'll just put up a picture in, in the next slide. If you look at any currency note, right, uh, it has a remark there which says that I promise to pay the bearer the sum of rupees 100 or maybe dollars 100 or pounds 100 or whatever it might be, right? So it's a, it's a promissory note. Now, they exchange, you know, resources. Uh, for instance, they can, you know, buy labor from the private sector for these promissory notes, right? That's essentially what they're doing. Uh, they give you a 100 rupee note and you might accept work, right? So uh, the bigger question is why do we accept these promissory notes and uh, in some sense work for the state, right? So uh, that's the most important point here. Uh, so why should the private sector accept these promissory notes, right? The reason for that in modern money theory actually comes from an older school of thought, uh, chartalism and so on, but uh, we'll keep that aside. We'll get to the basic point here. Is that the reason why we accept these promissory notes? Is that because uh, the state will only take these back and only these uh, currency notes? So I'm keeping out banking for the time being. Uh, but if you ignore banking, right, they will only take back these currency notes or uh, promissory notes uh, in settlement of any obligations owed to it, owed to the state, right? So if you have to pay your taxes, it can be paid only in, in these currency notes. They will not accept anything else. And that's very important. Okay, So uh, I'll just explain that with a, with a very simple example. Uh, but yeah, so what we are saying here is that modern money is essentially a tax credit. Okay, So they can give you these promissory notes and you will exchange goods and services with and the reason why we accept those promissory notes is because we need to pay our taxes and settle the obligations due to the state, owed to the state, only in these promissory notes. Okay, so that's really the key. So yeah, this is just a, a picture of some of the currency notes from different countries. You can see in the in Bank of England promises to pay the bearer on demand the sum of 10 pounds. Uh, in India, it's the sum of 10 rupees. In the US, I've shown you the will to pay the state will, the governor or the chairperson of the, uh, you know, uh, 
Fed will pay the bearer on demand twenty dollars. Okay, so that's really the, the the whole point of the promissory note. So you know, there's a, a MMT by the name of Warren Moslow gives a very interesting example of why we accept these promissory notes. Okay, so he talks about a classroom where the professor asks his students whether they would be willing to stay back in the classroom, uh, you know, for an hour after the lecture in order to clean up the room. Okay, so something for social good. Uh, and he promises, uh, he tells them that he would give them a visiting card each. Okay, so he asks the students whether they would be willing to work with that. And uh, obviously the students say, no, what, what would we do with the vis visiting cards, right? But then he says that in order to leave the room, there is a security guard at the door. And if you want to leave the room, you would have to hand over his visiting card. Okay. Now, as soon as he makes that you know, condition, puts that condition, right? All the students are willing to work for an hour for a visiting card, because that's the only way that they can leave the room, right? So if you look at the state, right, it's basically saying that you have to pay your taxes only in these promissory notes, right? They would not accept anything ex else except these printed pieces of paper. And there would always be someone who's willing to work for it, right? Because uh, you have to settle all your obligations owed to the state only in these promissory notes. So if they're able to enforce a tax, and right, then, uh, you know, uh, this becomes acceptable uh, to the general public. Uh, that's the, that's the, that's what drives money. Uh, now, it's also true that, you know, we can have exchanges in the private sector using our own promissory notes, right? So I can always go to my local grocery shop and issue a promissory note. And perhaps based on trust and things like that, uh, the grocery shop owner might give me, you know, 10 kilos of rice in exchange and say, okay, pay me after three months, right? But when it's time for final settlement, uh, he would want these promissory notes, right? Uh, and he would accept these promissory notes and final settlement of that obligation, which I owed to him, right? So that's the difference. Uh, you know, it's not that uh, we cannot issue our own promissory notes. They're unacceptable but they won't be generally acceptable. And final settlement will happen only in these promissory notes. So how do we define modern money? It's basically fiat currency plus legal tender. Okay, so that's that's the definition we would go by in MMT. Fiat currency means it's not convertible into precious metals or a foreign currency at a fixed exchange. rate. So there is no promise by the central bank to convert the rupees into dollars at any fixed rate. Okay, so they it's convertible at the going market rate, but not a fixed rate. <clears throat> it's also not convertible into precious metals. So we know that, right? So there is a promise to pay, uh, you know, uh, against that, for instance, if you look at this currency note, uh, the, you know, the governor promises to pay the bearer the sum of rupees 10. At one point of time, uh, you know, you would get 10 silver coins, 10 rupees for this, right? Rupees were essentially silver coins of approximately 11.66 grams, 96% purity or 92% purity. So you would actually get that in exchange. But today we have fiat currencies. So if I go to the central bank now with this 10 rupee note and ask them to give me rupees, they would give me two, five, five rupee coins or maybe a new note, right? But they won't give me silver or, or gold or whatever. Right? So uh, fiat currencies are not converted. It's also legal tender, and this is very important. Legal tender means that all obligations owed to the state must be settled only in this unit of account and money thing it specifies, and only that, uh, nothing else, right? So you cannot pay your taxes today in silver coins or, uh, you know, in gold or in rice or in wheat or whatever. You have to settle your tax obligations only in this money thing. Like I said, we'll keep banks out of this for the present, but yeah, I'll introduce that as the second tenet here. Okay. Uh, so imposition of tax obligations and the ability of the state to, to enforce uh, these tax, tax obligations in some sense drive modern money. Okay, so that's really why uh, the promissory notes of the state become generally acceptable. 
And yeah, this is true of most countries. Uh, if you notice here, I've not included the Euro because uh, they do not have modern money by this definition, at least the independent members. Uh, their members rather uh, do not have monetary sovereignty as, for instance, Japan, USA, UK, India, and so on. Okay, so it's better to look at modern money as a financial liability, right? Uh, their promissory note, basically, uh, rather than looking at it as an asset. It's certainly not a physical asset because that would become barter in some sense. Uh, and it's better to look at money as a financial liability. Now, the main thing about a financial liability, uh, unlike a physical asset, right? Uh, financial liability always appears in someone else's books of accounts as a physical as financial asset, sorry, right? So every financial liability, if I have a financial liability in my books of accounts, it must appear in some other person's books of accounts as a financial asset, right? Now, a physical asset, does not appear as a physical liability in somebody else's books of accounts, right? So if I own, for instance, 10 grams of gold or silver, that would appear purely as a, as a physical asset in my balance sheet as an asset, right? It doesn't appear in your books of accounts as a liability. Right? But if you have a financial asset, like you have maybe currency with you, right? In your wallet, you might have, let's say, 1,000 rupees. That appears in your books of accounts as an asset, at the same time, it's going to appear as a financial liability on the central bank's books, on the RBI, Reserve Bank of India's books, right? So keep that in, that's very important. So whatever appears as a financial liability in the central bank's books of accounts, right? Becomes a financial asset and has to be a financial asset to some other entity, right? And very often it's, it has to be the private sector. In some sense, okay? So, uh, yeah, that, you know, I'll come to debt again a little later, but yeah, this is very important. Okay. So always note that a financial liability has a uh, corresponding financial asset. How does this government introduce money into the economy? Essentially through, through its spending. And in a modern system, it's essentially through keystrokes, right? It doesn't really print money in, in a physical form today as much. That's only according to how much we desire to hold uh, in, 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 a, in the form of paper currency. But yeah, uh, typically money today is created by keystrokes uh, you know, through the uh, central bank. Okay? So when the government spends, it's basically you know, transferring money in some sense from the central bank through the bank, commercial banking system into a private uh, accounts which we hold in central banks. Okay, so. And then we might want to convert a part of that into cash, uh, which is done essentially on demand. So yeah, this is an interesting statement which Bernanke makes soon after the uh, you know, 2008 uh, recession. And he was asked in a hearing, you know, whether the government, I mean, the Federal Reserve was using taxpayers' money in order to bail out banks, right? So, uh, and I think this was on the on a program called 60 Minutes, where you know the interviewer. Uh, the, it also appears, yeah, later in an interview on 60 Minutes, which is interesting. But yeah, this was in during the hearing, and what Bernanke replied at that time was that it's not taxpayers' money or tax money. We use the computer to mark up the size of the account. So the rescue package was supposedly around five uh, five trillion dollars, I think, and uh, yeah, essentially they use the computer to, you know, enter the amount, five with 12 zeros. Okay, so that's really how it was done. You don't really print money in some sense, okay? Okay. Now, we can ask some fundamental questions here. Does the government really need to, you know, tax people before it spends, right? So if you look back at their example I gave you of the classroom, right? Uh, you know, do I really need, how could I even collect, you know, my own visiting cards without issuing them first, right? So if I had not issued the visiting cards and I'd asked the students to uh, present my visiting cards if they wanted to leave the room, they wouldn't be able to, right? So if the government does not spend its money into existence, 
there is no way it can collect taxes in that money thing right so actually the the if you think about it the spending has to come before the collection of revenues okay that's the fundamental uh, point we are making here that the government must first spend its money into existence and then collect a part of it back as revenues the second point is can the if you again uh, borrowings right so can the government actually borrow its own liabilities right so when the government issues bonds right uh, again i'm keeping out banking for the time being uh, but if you think of only a cash economy right how would the government uh, sell a bond to me for instance right because it wants its rupees in exchange okay so it takes the cash from me and gives me a bond right uh, it's not going to give me a bond for anything else except uh you know in exchange for cash which is which are its own financial liabilities right so what it's doing here is borrowing its own liabilities that's not possible you cannot borrow your own financial liabilities right so once again the borrowing has to happen after the spending okay both the tax collections and the borrowing happen after the spending and cannot happen before the spending so the question is why does it collect taxes then if it doesn't need so very often you know this is a this is an argument made against uh, mmt is that why do you need taxes at all right uh, you need taxes because unless you have you know uh, you you in some sense uh, you know compel the people to pay taxes they wouldn't accept your promissory notes right so taxes drive money so you need to enforce taxes Uh, and only then people are going to accept your promise promissory notes right so uh, taxes have to be there in order to drive money but apart from that taxes do serve other purposes right uh, the government collects collecting taxes actually destroys money so it destroys purchasing power in some sense right so it can be a useful means of controlling inflation it might also address some other you know uh, aspects like you know you might want to address the problem of inequalities you might also want to you know change the allocation of resources let's say from you know uh, polluting technologies to green technologies you might use taxes there but if you look at a purely financial and monetary purpose uh, i think taxes are essentially to drive money they drive the promissory notes of the state and uh, you know also to control inflation to some extent and if you think why why does the government issue bonds uh, it's essentially because they want you to postpone your spending they might not want to you know demotivate you by collecting everything out as taxes uh, they might say okay you postpone your spending and we'll give you something in exchange for that we'll pay you an interest rate for that so really it's to postpone spending it's not really a source of revenues that's what we want to emphasize and we'll see we'll touch upon this later we cannot go too much into depth in this aspect but yeah, bonds are also an important instrument of monetary policy because uh, banks if once we introduce banks banks who hold a lot of bonds which are then used for repo transactions and you know in order to uh, for the the central bank to pursue its monetary policy okay but uh, what is important here we should understand is that bonds are not really a, a, a way of collecting revenues it's not really a fiscal policy instrument it's more an instrument of monetary policy in order to achieve interest rate targets set by the central bank and so on okay so that's that's what we want to highlight here okay uh, the problem of fiscal deficits right so we are all concerned you know generally speaking about fiscal deficits and you know it's become a big issue in the media you know the first thing about the budget which is discussed across television channels is the fiscal deficit whether we have been made you know we have been able to get it within 3% 4% you know these numbers right uh, i'm not saying that it should be 20% or it should be 2% it's just that today fiscal deficit numbers the target numbers have become you know uh, an end in itself in some sense so fiscal deficits we know are nothing but uh, government spending minus taxes uh, that's how we define the fiscal deficit and public debt is the accumulation of these fiscal deficits over the pe over period of time uh, right so we saw the you know the graph earlier 
that the public debt of the U.S. is basically accumulated fiscal deficits, and it's been increasing uh, steadily, you know, for for decades. Uh, so, what is happening when the government is running a fiscal deficit, right? Like I said earlier, fiscal deficits are nothing but the liabilities of the state or the government, right? If you combine, if you take the central bank as an institution of the state, so it's basically accumulating liabilities, but these financial liabilities must be a financial asset to somebody else, right? That's uh, accounting 101, so you cannot dispute that. And whose asset is it, right? It's my asset, it's your asset, it's the asset of the private sector. Right. So in order for the private sector to accumulate net financial assets, right, the government, the state, in some sense, has to run, accumulate financial liability. OK. If the state were to run, you know, uh, accumulate uh, financial assets, then somebody has to have financial liability. Right. And that must be you and me. Right? So, for instance, if I have 1,000 rupees in my wallet, what does it mean? It means that the government has spent some amount and taxed something less than that amount, which must be 1,000 rupees, because that's what remains with me, right? Now, if they want to run a, a fiscal you know, balanced budget, they could have taxed me the whole amount, right? So let's say they spent 10,000 rupees, or let's keep it at 3,000 rupees. They've taxed me 2,000. I have 1,000 rupees in my wallet. Now, if they say, no, we want to have a balanced budget, then they can tax me the remaining amount, right? And when they do that, I don't have a financial asset anymore. If they were to tax now after spending 3,000 rupees, they have to impose a tax of 4,000 rupees. Then what does it mean? It means I have to surrender the entire 3,000 that has been spent. I would also have a financial liability now, an additional 1,000 rupees which has to remain as a financial liability, or I have to settle it with my savings. And you don't want to do that because if I dip into my savings, you're going to concentrate consumption spending in the economy, which is going to drive us into a recession, right? So, you know, this whole idea that the, you know, we have this notion that the state is like you and me, and therefore, just like it's prudent for me not to be in debt, right, in some sense, the state too must be in that position, right? And they must have a fiscal surplus. So, you know, I think it was uh, in the previous election campaign that Hillary Clinton says that she would run a, you know, a budget surplus, right? Now, if she runs a budget surplus for the US, it means that the private sector is in deficit, right? That's going to, uh, you know, uh, induce a recession in the economy, right? So why would they want to do that? But yeah, it's, it's this whole idea that the government should be. It's always better for the state to run deficits. Okay, because they can. If you think about it again, right? How does the state actually repay? You know, let's say it runs a deficit, it issues a bond, and then it says, okay, I have to repay the bond after 10 years, right? How does it repay the bond? It repays the bond only by issuing new financial liabilities. Right? It could give you cash, for example, which is a financial liability, or it, or it would issue a new bond. There's no other way it can repay. Right? So there's no repayment in that sense for the state. Okay? So they repay it with new financial liabilities. Uh, that's the key here, uh, which I cannot do, right? Because when I take three months credit for my grocery shop here in the neighborhood, when it's time to settle the debt, I cannot issue a new liability and give it to the person, right? They won't take it. They say, no, you settle it with the liability of the state, but not your liabilities, okay? So they won't roll it over in some sense, right? But the state does only that. You don't repay debt in any other way. And that's the reason why debt never falls, right? They could do it in some sense through, you know, auctioning of, you know, let's say, uh, you know, uh, you know, 3G networks or whatever, but that's very small. It cannot really repay the entire, you know, uh, debt of the state. Okay. So, yeah, keep in mind that public debt is nothing but the financial assets of the private sector. Okay. So, when we, for instance, see these numbers, you know, the US, they have a debt block, right? Uh, if you look at these numbers, 
This is about 12 trillion. This is old data. I think now it's about 20 trillion, if I'm not wrong. What does it mean, right? This is the national debt of the US and people get worried about it because this is clicking all the time, increasing, and they put the share of the people. Right? So the share of the people here is what? $100,000, right? So people get afraid of this. But if you really look at it the other way, it's nothing but the assets of the, of the private sector, right? So it's, it's great, actually. There's nothing wrong with it. So, for instance, I own Government of India bond, right? It's the debt of the state, but it's, for me, the best savings that I can have, right? It's the safest uh, savings that I can have today. I can put my money, my savings, and equity shares. I can put it in gold and property, but all of them are risky. Uh, but the, the financial liabilities of the state, of the Government of India, is the safest, uh, you know, uh, savings instrument for me. So my my portfolio of savings would always have some amount of, you know, maybe a PPF account, it might be you know, government of India bonds, some very safe instrument. And there's nothing safer than a, in India, a GOI bond. So yeah, I think we should think very carefully about fiscal deficits, about fiscal surpluses, and, you know, uh, yeah, uh, not get carried away by numbers. Uh, that's very important. Okay. So MMT then argues that a government can never be, you know, can never go bankrupt in its own currency. And I want to emphasize in its own currency because this this is very important for many of the crises that you know South Asian countries are facing, right? Uh, but yeah, any even Sri Lanka or Pakistan or whatever, you know, any others. Asian country or developing country would never go broke in its own currency. Okay, uh, that's very important. that doesn't mean it cannot go broke. It can go broke in obviously uh, in dollars. Okay, uh, yeah, this I've touched upon. Debt's nothing but you know it's not debt the way we think of it. It's basically an accounting uh, entry, basically. So very often now the argument against MMT is that the government. Uh, you're, we are arguing here that the government can issue its own financial liabilities. There's no really you know, upper limit to it. And therefore, the government must do that or should do that. Right? That's not the argument that we're making here at all. Right? We're just saying that it's, it's, this is the, the way the monetary system has been, you know, has evolved and has been you know, in, in, in created. Uh, and we should leverage this wherever necessary. Right? Doesn't mean that the government should spend unlimited amounts or something. Okay, but yeah, it can. Okay. Uh, so when we're talking, you know, about spending, right? There is no doubt that spending can lead to inflation, uh, and that's the critical limit actually that MMTs, you know, always are uh, arguing that you know inflation is is an indication of overspending to some sense. It's to some extent. But inflation, again, is not necessarily a macroeconomic phenomenon purely. Uh, it could be because of, you know, uh, certain, uh, you know, like, for instance, supply chain uh, bottlenecks. It could be because of a war. It could be because of something else. And it could be very sectoral. It need not be very general across the economy. Uh, so we need better theories of inflation, of course. But, yeah, inflation is a sign of uh, excessive spending. To, a, to some extent, right? Now, obviously for countries like India, uh, you know, there are issues about the balance of payments and exchange rate issues. So, uh, you know, there is India and, you know, most of the countries, right, except the US, uh, would have more constraints in the US, right? Because it's, they are not international reserve currencies and therefore there would be, you know, degrees of monetary sovereignty. But that, that doesn't mean that we don't have, uh, you know, leverage, okay? So we do have leverage, but, uh, you know, complexity of the economy, uh, you know, the nature of our exports, all that does make a difference, okay? So, uh, in fact, uh, one of my students is working on the issue of monetary sovereignty and whether we can create an index of monetary sovereignty across uh, some of the developing countries. Now, many of the crises that we come across, like Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and so on, have been really, uh, you know, in the 
external or dollar denominated debt, right? That's where the countries get uh, into a problem because they cannot issue the financial liabilities of the US, right? They cannot issue dollars. So obviously then there is a problem, right? So very often what they do in order to repay debt is to go out in markets and start buying the dollars. Uh, their own currencies depreciate. You have, you know, imported inflation, things get out of hand, right? So, yeah, one has to be very careful about external dollar de denominated debt. And, you know, if you look at the Sri Lankan problem, right, essentially they depended depended uh, de only on, ex you know, to a large extent on tourism. And when tourism crashed during the pandemic, they didn't have enough dollars to service their debt and so on, right? So, uh, I think that's very important that uh, one must not leverage, uh, you know, excessively the uh, the external debt. Okay, so that's that's a very important indicator. I think in that respect, India is very safe because our dollar denominated debt is now only about four five percent of GDP, right? So it's it's very much under control here, and therefore uh, there is it can never be similar to these. Uh, you know, these economies, at least in the present country. Okay. Uh, I don't know how I'm running on time, but uh, how much time do I have? Uh, you can still take another five to 10 minutes. Okay. So let me, uh, yeah, I, I won't touch upon the job guarantee scheme, but yeah, that's, you know, one of the policy implications of MMT is that they, they, they argue that, or rather we argue that uh, the government can always, uh, you know, uh, afford a universal job guarantee scheme. And that's really what is required. Uh, uh, having unemployment is a waste of resources. It's inefficient. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, these are, I'll go quickly through this. So yeah, the, the whole, you know, argument that, uh, you know, when you have large debt, you have high interest rates crowding out the private sector. If you look at the pre-pandemic data, right, you can see clearly that, you know, uh, the U.S. ran huge deficits, but uh, interest rates were close to zero. If you look at Japan, you know they have the largest uh, debt-to-GDP ratios in the Western world. I think more than 250% of GDP, the interest rate was zero. Uh, same with inflation. Pre-pandemic, uh, inflation was very low in the U.S. Uh, in spite of large debt, in spite of large fiscal deficits, and the same with Japan. Okay, Japan was struggling with deflation. Uh, in spite of its large debt. So there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, inflation and uh, deficits, okay? So that's that's a weak argument. Okay, let me just touch upon banking very quickly uh, because this is another very important uh, aspect of MMT. It comes from, you know, it's sort of been uh, brought into the fold of MMT by MMTers. It's also an independent uh, school of thought, the whole endogenous money theory. Okay, so... Uh, we know that most of the transactions in in the modern world are uh, you know done through bank uh, bank uh, deposits right and not through uh, cash we don't use cash as much but we use uh, you know basically our savings banks accounts or current accounts to transfer you know money between uh, you know uh, companies or between individuals or whatever in order to settle uh, you know debt obligations which arise in exchange so uh, the textbook, uh, you know, uh, way of, uh, you know, understanding banking is really that they are intermediaries which collect deposits and channelize them into loans, right? So they take uh, sa our savings and give it out to somebody else who's then putting it back as investment spending. You know, in the circular flow, we learn that. So that's really the common notion of banking. But today, we, uh, you know, even the Bank of England published a paper in 2014 where they accepted that this is not the way it works. Banks actually create money endogenously, right, out of thin air, uh, you know, uh, basically by passing an accounting entry, and this is how they create money. So if I go to the bank for a loan of 100 rupees, they take my document where I promise to pay them a loan, uh, pay back my loan of 100 rupees, and because I promised to pay back the sum of 100 rupees after, let's say, a year, they have to give me something in exchange, right? And they give me a deposit. They credit that amount into my deposit account of 100 rupees, which is their liability, okay? So I have given them 
an asset and they give me another asset in return, which is a deposit account in my name, right? That's how the banks create money. So it's, and uh, there, there's a, there's a uh, economist by the name of Richard Werner who studies uh, what really happened in a bank. Uh, when he took a loan, he, he, he sat with the bankers and saw the accounting entry. So there was no transfer from Mr. X or Ms. X into his account. Okay, so it was, there was, you know, if you think of banks as an intermediary, then, you know, when I take a loan, right, they must be debiting your account to some extent, right, uh, and somebody else's account to, uh, you know, for that amount, right, but that doesn't happen, right, this is the entry that they pass, uh, that's money is created, because now I can use this liability of this commercial bank, right, that deposit account is a liability of the commercial bank, right. I can use this deposit account in order to buy something from you, right? And settle the you know amount, uh, that obligation which arises when I buy something from you, right? You wouldn't take my promissory note, right? The loan, but you will take the promissory note in a sense of the bank. And why do you do that? Because you can pay your taxes today using those deposit accounts. That's the key here, right? So the reason why commercial bank money has become acceptable to this degree is because we can now settle our obligations owed to the state using these, you know, uh, financial liabilities of the commercial bank. So it's partly evolved, it's partly by design, uh, but this is how it works today. Right? You don't have to necessarily use only cash, right? The promissory notes of the central bank itself. You can now use the promissory notes of a commercial bank. Okay, so now you know I won't get into this. I think it'll take too long. But this is how the spending happens today, right? So when the government spends, let's say on a road project, right, it gets me as a contractor. How does it pay me, right? It pays. This is the flow of money it goes through the central bank, uh, the commercial banks, and then to the So the key point here is uh, how do commercial, you know, for instance, if I if I send you, if I have bought something from you and I have to pay you 1,000 rupees, right? So basically, if you just think of the old system, I issue a check, you deposit the check in your bank, right? Which is basically transferring the deposit account from me in, you know, into your deposit account, which you hold in with another commercial bank, right? So the problem here is how do commercial banks then have settled their you know uh, financial obligations, right? So if Canara Bank has to transfer the money to Maharashtra Bank, where you hold our account, then how does Canara Bank transfer the money to Maharashtra Bank, right? Now they do it using the their accounts at the central bank, right? So just like you and me have accounts with the commercial bank, the commercial bank has accounts with the central bank, which is basically what we call as reserve accounts, right? So Canara Bank's reserve account would be in some sense debited by 1,000 rupees and Maharashtra Bank would get, you know, a credit of 1,000 rupees, right? And then also you would get that in your name, in your deposit, okay? Now, so that's how it works. Uh, Interbank transactions have to be settled only in reserve money. That's why all checks have to be cleared or all transfers have to be cleared only by the central bank, right? Uh, and in the modern system, you know, if if a bank, for instance, falls short of this reserve money, right? So if Canara Bank doesn't have the money to transfer to Maharashtra Bank, it's not that their check will bounce in some sense, right? That cannot happen because then the whole payment system is going to collapse, right? So what do they do then? They can either borrow it in the money markets, uh, right? Or they can always borrow this from the reserve bank itself, right? And the reserve bank will always oblige them with reserve money, right? In exchange for certain, you know, uh, maybe government bonds, maybe, right? Most likely in government bonds, uh, they would exchange these bonds for reserve money. They actually do not lend money to the commercial banks because they are lending a financial liability. Right? They cannot do that. So what they actually do is a swap. Right? They take the bond from the commercial bank and give them in return reserve money. Okay, so that's really what they would do. 
and today they would do that at a at what's called the repo rate right so that's the you know how so uh, you know what we typically learn is that you know uh, m0 right controls m1 if you think back about the money multiplier theory what we say is m0 controls m1 but uh, it's actually m1 which determines m0 right so if the banking system expands credit in the economy uh, the the central bank would support them with reserve money for their interbank transactions okay in exchange for 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 government securities right so government securities are very important and once again the government you know the state has to run finance uh, fiscal deficit so that they issue these government securities right with a surplus they wouldn't have government securities to issue so for instance countries like norway have this problem right so it's very important as a tool of monetary policy and that's what i said earlier okay okay uh, yeah so uh, this is what i said that today it's not savings which determines investment but it's credit really right so credit banks create money in order to you know uh, accommodate investment spending which then drives incomes and then gives rise to savings okay. so yeah, and we, uh, yeah, this is a problem of NPAs, but yeah, I think time is short. So, yeah, when, you know, people don't repay their loans, there's a problem and then yeah, it causes stress for banks. But yeah, the, you know, financial crisis, banking crisis is very dangerous because you can see from the second line here that credit flows are very important, right? Because that's really what accommodates uh, investments. And, uh, you know, Credit has to come before production happens, before incomes are generated, right? So that's very, so we are not today no longer savings constraint, but yeah, banking is very important to, to drive credit. Okay. So my last slide here is that, so think of money more as a financial liability. So, you know, uh, we, we settle, you know, obligations which arise in exchanges between ourselves using cash, which are the liabilities of the central bank or the state in general, or we use demand deposits, right? Uh, current account, savings banks account, uh, which are liabilities of the commercial banks. And then, you know, the commercial banks themselves use, uh, uh, for interbank settlements, they use uh, the financial liabilities of the central bank, right? So all, all transactions today are being settled uh, using financial liabilities. Okay. And that really differentiates, uh, you know, uh, modern money from things like cryptocurrencies, bitcoins, which are basically very akin to, you know, physical assets, right? They, they don't, if, if I own a bitcoin, it will not appear in anybody else's books as a liability. It's a physical asset, a digital asset. Okay. So that's the key difference. Uh, so overall, I just quote, uh, Joseph Stendhal, who said that, you know, he's a, he's a very staunch Keynesian who says that we should be wary of the argument that there is no money for it, right? So when you hear this argument, there is no money for something, I think it's a weak one. We should always ask whether there is any real scarcity of, uh, you know, real scarcity, right? Scarcity of water, scarcity of uh, food grains, scarcity of, you know, infrastructure, whatever it may be, right? So that's, that's really where we should ask questions, okay? Okay, so thank you. Take questions. All right, so I think Vikram is going to handle the QA question. But before I give him uh, the chair to take other questions, I have a couple of questions. So let me go backwards. So you mentioned banking crisis, which was usually the inability to pay the NPA. Now we saw in the case of uh, the SVB crisis in the US, it was not the inability to pay, but more so the inability of the bank to fulfill its obligations that were coming. The withdrawals from its depositors couldn't be satisfied. How do you put this in the perspective of MMT? One. Second, you mentioned that government bonds are usually a fiscal approach or a fiscal policy or two, but it's a Monetary policy. The government bonds a monetary policy. Now, coming to that point that government usually borrows uh, or issues bonds and then redistributes that money towards infrastructure or creation of assets. 
So in that sense, it is also a physical uh, policy too, that it is creating something, it is doing an expenditure uh, from the bonds issue. So that's the second point. Uh, so I'll stop now. Uh, and while you ask, uh, answer these, maybe we'll have other couple of questions. Sure, sure. Okay, so SVB crisis, uh, I think was, uh, you know, mistake in some sense by the Fed, right? But what happened there is, uh, the Fed has been increasing rates. Right? Uh, it, it's actually not a situation like 2008 or, you know, uh, where the government, uh, where the bank really took undue risks, right? So on the asset side of the balance sheet of SVP, you have securities, right? Apart from loans and things like that. In fact, they'd invested a lot of money, right? In government securities, okay? Now, what happened is when the interest rates rose, the value of those securities fell, right? Because you know the price of the bonds are inversely related to the, the interest rates, right? So what happened is all of a sudden, the assets, the value of assets collapsed, right? They still had their liabilities, the depositors' money, correct? So you had an imbalance in the, in the balance sheet. But there were some speculators who saw this imbalance and said, listen, there's a problem here. The bank is actually bankrupt. Okay. And they started selling the shares of the company, of the bank. Right. Now, when, when the depositors saw the value of the shares falling, they went to the bank and said, give us our money back. Okay. So it, it, was a, it wasn't a typical financial crisis where they have lent money to, uh, you know, uh, not following norms. In fact, they were overcautious. And they've invested in the safest security, which is a you know government security. But the Fed did not expect this. So it wasn't difficult to solve at all, right? You saw the Fed solved it in a minute, really. They just said that we'll give you reserve money in exchange for the you know maturity value of the bond. So you don't go by the market value of the bond, right? You don't market to market, you market to the maturity. And that was the end of the problem. So you know. Very frankly, uh, the Fed can, you know, uh, clear debts of all of us, need not be only of banks, right? Because they create the, the reserve money, right? So they can take away the loans from your, your, your balance sheet. There's no problem for the Fed uh, or for the reserve bank, right? The only problem is moral hazard. Okay, so when they, they waive, for example, farmers' loans, it's not, that's not the problem. The money is not the problem. The problem is moral hazard. Because all they can, they just have to print their financial liabilities and wipe it out, right? That's why they're asking for, you know, uh, student debt cancellation in the U.S., right? The Fed can do it. The only problem then is that, you know, more and more people might take debt and not uh, complete their education. It might become a moral hazard issue. Right? It may not have happened in the past. You know, everyone's going to do it. But, yeah, this is the problem, right? So they can... so. I wrote a paper recently in Money Control, which says that ultimately what's happening is that, uh, you know, these bank crises are becoming more and more regular kind of thing. And the Fed is always coming in and bailing them out because there's systemic risk, right? If the collapse. So where does it stop, right? Just imagine now you have only a central bank and no commercial banks. Crises are over because the, uh, the central bank can always have you know, negative net worth. There's no problem. They create the money, right? They, the state creates money. We are all users of money, right? When you're the creator of money, you can have a negative net worth. And many central banks in the world do have negative net worth, right? Their, their liabilities are more than their assets and nothing happens to them. The private sector is a problem. So maybe, you know, with CBDCs and so on, we'll see that happening more and more that, you know, we would be allowed to have accounts directly at the central bank. Then why would I go to a commercial bank, right? If I can have an account at the central bank. Uh, and the central bank is also able to disperse loans to the private sector. Then where is commercial banking? So maybe it's going to get centralized. There'll be advantages and disadvantages. But yeah, the people are already seeing that as a threat and a possibility. Uh, your second question was bonds. Yeah, so today the rule is that the you know the government has to first borrow and then spend, right? 
But what we have today is very intricate system with primary dealers and so on. But if you follow through the whole sequence of you know processes which happen, right? When the government borrows and then spends, it really boils down to the same thing. Okay, I can share some uh, material with you for the whole set of transactions which happen, right? Because, you know, uh, if you just think of it a little abstractly, right? Borrowings are nothing. What is the government actually borrowing? Right? It's borrowing its own financial liabilities, right? Why would you borrow your own financial liabilities in order to spend? Right? <laughs> Does it make sense? You cannot borrow your own financial liability, right? So, you know, I take sugar from you, let's say a kilo and give you a promissory note. And then I say, can I borrow that promissory note from you? <laughs> it doesn't make sense, right? So if you think of it abstractly, borrowings are nothing but, uh, you know, in some sense, uh, taking back your financial liability. So it has to be that the spending has to come first, okay? I think today what they try to do is to mop up as much savings as possible, right? And then the remaining part, they would issue new new money. Okay? That, that's really what they do. Uh, uh, you know, because people, all of us, you know, want to lend to the government. And banks especially have to have government securities, right? For in order to, you know, when they expand credit, they need to uh, get reserve money from the central bank, that's when they need the bonds. So they always accumulate bonds. And you and me also would always want to have enough portfolio of savings, a certain amount of government debt in order to feel safe. So that's why it's not a fiscal operation. It's more a monetary operation. Okay. okay. Yeah, so uh, I'll now open the floor for the participant and I would request participant to use the raise hand option so that it will be easy, we can say. Uh, and also, Professor Shashi, would you like to take a few questions and then and respond to the one to one, like how you'd like to go with the uh, question session? Okay. Uh, how do you answer the financial crisis of Greece or SPB in the perspective of MMT? So SPB, 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 I think I've answered, not Silicon Valley. Okay. Greece, that's why I said in the beginning itself, don't take Europe. Europe doesn't have modern money, right? Europe, the individual member states, right, are like you and me to some extent, because the ECB is, not controlled by any one country, right? It's not their currency. So Greece, for example, becomes like a company, right? When it needed euro, it has to go to the market to work, right? That's the problem for Greece. That's why they got into a crisis. Now, Greece, obviously, you know, people were afraid that, you know, it might not be able to repay these euros because it has to earn the euros and repay, right? Uh, that, that's the problem. Uh, so that's why they got into a crisis, right? So during the pandemic, the first thing that the ECB said, don't worry, we'll buy the bonds, right? And therefore the yields did not you know, go up the way they went up in the Brexit problem, right? So that's a big difference, right? So keep Europe has, in a sense, given up their monetary sovereignty, right? For, for, for whatever purposes they thought would be beneficial, right? But they gave up monetary sovereignty. And that's why England or the UK, I mean, at that time, did not join the monetary union, right? Because giving up monetary sovereignty is the giving up your ability to create money. And therefore, you have to actually borrow like an individual, like a company or a state government, right? Or a municipality. You become like that. So Greece has this problem. But I think the European Central Bank has realized this and during the pandemic, they did not force Greece to go out in the market. They said, okay, we'll lend to you. Right? If Greece was forced to go out in the market to borrow it during the pandemic, then I think the EU would have collapsed. Right? So they, they were more supportive. But yeah. the other question is... Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. Firdos has a second question. So would you like to unmute yourself, Firdos, and ask the question or will Firdos, can you, will you unmute yourself and 
I can answer it. Uh, ah, yeah, you can answer it. Okay. So yeah, this is the new uh, big topic that is being discussed is about international reserve currencies. So yeah, my take is that, you know, we could use the rupee, we could use other currencies uh, for trade between countries, right? Uh, but I don't think we can replace the dollar as the global reserve currency, right? So for international trade, international, right? It's possible that we can use it, but it will reduce to barter. Uh, what I mean here is that if I'm buying thousand rupees worth of stuff from Russia, then Russia has to buy thousand rupees stuff from us, right? Because who's going to accumulate rubles? For instance, if the if Russia has a surplus, right? Then we would be accumulating, uh, you know, they would be accumulating rupees, right? To what extent would they be willing to accumulate rupees? Now they we would have to issue bonds for that, right? so or something like that. Right? Uh, I don't think that's possible, right? Uh, if you look at the US, what, how, how does the dollar become international reserve currency? It's because the US runs perpetual trade deficits, right? It's only when their imports are greater than their exports that you and me can hold dollars, I mean countries, right? If you look at any of the other major currencies today which are competing with the dollar for that status, right? If you look at the, the euro, for example, if you look at uh, the Chinese yuan, right? Uh, uh, all these countries are actually running current account surpluses. So how would they become global reserve currency, right? They have to run perpetual deficits, right? India does run deficits, but the volume is not enough to uh, provide the whole world with liquidity, right? So which country would be willing to, you know, run perpetual current account deficits in order to provide liquidity to the rest of the world, right? I don't think China would be would be willing to do that, uh, you know? Uh, so how would it become a reserve currency? And it has to be a large economy. It has to be, you know, yeah, uh, it has to be of that size. Maybe the European Union or China and maybe Japan. Japan, if you take the yen, maybe a large economy, uh, but, once again, it's not running uh, deficits, it's running surpluses, right? So that's why they're accumulating dollars. If they want the rest of the world to accumulate yen or euros or yuan, then they have to run the deficits, right? Will they be willing to run those deficits? I doubt it, okay? India and the UK do run deficits, but it's not large enough. If, if the rupee has to become global reserve currency, we have to run, run very large deficits. It's a huge issue. I don't think it's possible. But yeah, between two countries, yes, we can maybe substitute the dollar. But I think that will be close to barter. They would sort of have to cancel out imports and exports. I don't think it can be one-sided, right? So I would see that as a problem. Anyone uh, else would like to go? Can I unmute yourself and just ask the question? Yeah. I think there might not be more questions. I have one question, which is sure. a little bit uh, di like uh, different from it. So, like, if we see the like money, money theory or understand the money thing, so. Like, what is the issue if we then bring in the universal basic income? Because and like because it will, the money, if we see that it will be given into hand and it, again, in a form of tax or something else, it will come back to government or the financial institution. So how you see this whole debate of universal basic income? Because there are both side debate, like some are agreeing. There are social aspects which might, which is relevant that it might encourage people yeah. not to work and, uh, but how you see it in the context of monetary theory or financial theory? So yeah, I would say going by pure MMT, there is no problem. You can, you can give any income to anybody. I mean, you can set the limit yourself. I mean, sky is the limit, right? So 
The problem with universal basic income in a more macroeconomic sense is that uh, you are trying to bridge a shortage in demand through basic income, right? One is, of course, addressing issues of, you know, uh, basic needs of people or whatever. So that part, but essentially it's also a problem why the advanced countries are thinking about it is because there is a problem of demand in the economy, right? Let's keep aside the pandemic period because things have changed. But typically there was a uh, you know, lack of demand, say in Japan or the US and so on, right? That's why inflation was always so low, right? So yeah, you give you some money so that you go out and buy stuff, right? Now the problem with that is that uh, you're not adding to supply there. Correct. So demand will keep increasing at some point, right? But you're not adding to supply because people who go on to basic income may not stop working, right? In the sense, contributing anything to aggregate supply, right? I mean, if you sit at home and write poetry, I don't think that would really shut the supply curve, right? But yeah, in terms of real output and so on, that might become a problem, which might then lead to inflation and, you know, uh, again, problematic, right? Because uh, you would have to raise the basic income then and then. You know, so it's very important to add to aggregate supply. At the same time, you add to aggregate demand in a purely macroeconomic sense. So for that reason, the MMT school of thought argues that why have a basic income strategy? Why not have an employment guarantee? Right? Because employment, you could use it effectively to also address your aggregate supply. It's more productive employment. Right? It's like work for food kind of scheme. So. You know, that, that could be a better strategy than universal basic income. So MMT says that there is no monetary problem, money problem for, for you know, UBI. But if you think you know, purely, you know, your capability to produce in the longer term is better with the employment guarantee scheme, right? And yeah, so, you know, we argue in favor of an urban job guarantee scheme, right? Because many of these things can be used productive, made productive, right? How you formulate the scheme also is important, right? And the government does some very good work with Madhreka, right? So you can use that strategy rather than, you know, uh, 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 a basic income strategy. So, yeah, there is, typically we don't see a problem with the money aspect, but yeah, more in terms of uh, creating more, you know, the possibility for increasing output is greater with a job guarantee than a basic income. Yeah, uh, like if you are okay, then we'll have one more, one last question and we'll wrap it up as we have already exceeded the one hour time. Yeah, is, so one question is on Bitcoin. Maybe I can just touch on yeah, that yeah. last. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just add on to that question. One, I also had a similar one that I was also look, thinking of, like you have talked about cash and uh, like deposit and all, but how do you see also the digital transaction? Because as we see in the cash or other, it it says that it promises that you will be you are liable to pay, but in digital currency, like how it going, which is like in similar context, whether it's like Bitcoin, as it said, or also the how the digital currency going to change the whole banking and the monetary theory. Nothing uh, for if you look at it purely from a modern money theory perspective, Bitcoins will never replace uh, state state money. Essentially, because when it comes to paying. And if you're doing all your transactions legally, we can assume that, right? You might do some things uh, illegally, which, uh, which are not recorded, but we cannot run an economy, right? So you have to pay your taxes in rupees. You cannot pay it in Bitcoin. You do what, see, you and me can do a transaction with gold or Bitcoin. It may not be illegal, right? I don't know whether what the current uh, regulations are, but there's nothing wrong. But when it, if I make a profit, I sell you a painting and I take some gold from you, right? I make a profit on it. I have to disclose that profit to the government and pay my taxes, right? If it's a legal transaction, right? To pay my taxes, I need rupees. I cannot pay it in gold, correct? So how do I pay my taxes? So it's better for me to sell the painting to you in rupees, pay my taxes. If I have any savings from that, I can buy gold. It's absolutely legal. That's what I would do rather than transacting with you in gold because ultimately my taxes have to be computed in rupees. What if the price of gold falls from now to 31st March 24? 
right? So I don't always transact with you in rupees. Bitcoins can never be, if you see the price of Bitcoins, right? They've been going from what? I don't know, $40,000 to $20,000. Suppose I denominated your salary in Bitcoin, right? Six months ago, your salary would have been 40,000. Today is 20,000. It's not a stable means of exchange at all. There's no stability in Bitcoin. You can never, so El, uh, I think it was El Salvador, they made Bitcoin legal tender, but they didn't make it the unit of account. The unit of account still remained the dollar. They were, very, they were very cautious on that, right? So these are not stable. Gold today is fluctuating so much. You can, the, the dollar or the rupee is still far more stable. Right? Because you can control the demand and you can control the supply of rupees in some sense in the economy, credit and you know, whatever it is, right? You cannot control these physical assets and they're limited, right? So Bitcoin is issued to a certain extent. It's It's not... And the volume of transactions being, you know, transacted in bitcoins is very, 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 very small. It's a pure speculative Ponzi scheme. <laughs> That's how I would think of it. You know, when Elon Musk sells his bitcoin, it crashes. When somebody buys, it goes up. He's put it on Twitter. It'll go up even more. This is, it's a Ponzi scheme. There's no real value. I don't see it. Okay. If there are no more questions, then we'll Am I wrap audible? up the session. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, respected sir, I have this concern, which is regarding this uh, uh, payment channels that have been developed recently in India. So, uh, which were uh, earlier said that, you know, with the rise in digital transaction, it is support that the currency in circulation is to be reduced, but as we have seen uh, with the data released by the RBI, that the currency in circulation in volume terms, it has been on constant rise, whereas like a trend in the transaction of through digital currency or maybe with uh, digital payment system, it's also increasing. So how do you evaluate this contradiction and how do you evaluate its impact on the black economy in India? If I have constructed this very okay. correctly. Yeah, so I think, yeah, you know, both would increase basically over time, right? So uh, as the economy grows, there's, you know, people want to transact with digital currencies. So a lot of people are accepting that. But I would say generally there's also a demand for cash, right? So for instance, uh, I might draw, prefer to, you know, I don't trust my mobile phone for whatever reason. I want to hold some more in cash. I go to the bank, draw the money and use cash, right? So I think preferences. So uh, you know, for, if you go to Japan, for example, this is what I understand. I'm not, I've not been there, so uh, that people prefer to use cash, in spite of it being Japan and you know electronically very savvy. They're you know, it's Japan after all, but they use cash, right? So it's a little of cultural habit also. It's difficult to grow, uh, get away from that, right? I, I'm sure both will grow simultaneously. I don't see, uh, and personally, I don't see a problem with. Uh, cash of course yeah there would be a black economy but yeah that, that tax enforcement has to become better to some extent but yeah I, I, I don't have any estimates of that but yeah I, for me it's not surprising because cash is nothing but you know I'm converting the bank's promissory note the demand deposit right into the state's uh, uh, you know promissory that's really what I'm doing right so when I go to the bank to draw cash what is happening the bank reduces their liability to pay me certain amount. And instead, they give me the promissory note of the state, right? So they call the RBI literally and say, okay, send some money. And, you know, their reserve account is debited at the RBI and they give me cash, right? It's my preference what I want to hold. Now, yeah, there is a possibility there is, you know, I'm people are not paying taxes, but I think that that's a different issue in that sense, how they the tax enforcement mechanism, the tax collection mechanism, right? So I think that estimates I don't have, but I don't see a contradiction there. So I think as the economy grows, both would grow. And uh, certain European countries, they prefer completely digital, I think today, Sweden, maybe. Japan is still preference for cash, right? So a lot of transactions are happening in cash in Japan. It's a cultural thing. 
I think even many of the Western countries, they don't have the kind of uh, electronic payment uh, what we find in India. So, right? Still not maybe as... So just yesterday I was reading that some of the Western countries actually look... UPI, for example, is a great addition in India and things like that. So they still don't see those kinds of payment systems uh, having developed. I think it's a cultural thing. It's uh, It'll take its own course. Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, we have already exceeded time, so we'll wrap it up. And as we come to the end, let me extend the heartful thanks to the, our speaker and also all the participants who have joined from across the world and also has been in like uh, enriched discussion and also uh, the speaker for giving an informative session. So once again, thank you so much, Professor, for accepting our invitation and uh, enlightening us with your insightful talk. So, and also I thank heartfully to the YSI part members as well as the participant for joining us today. Once again, thank you all and hope to see you soon in the upcoming session and have a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you Bye. all. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.